Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today we are interviewing one of our top sales associates in Todd Scalise. Um, uh, Todd uh, was given the assignment and has been doing a lot of research on Alberto Valdez, who we have covered before. Um, I uh, want to give uh, reference to our audience. Uh, you can go uh, back into our podcast, uh, number 19, um, where we interviewed Alberto's uh, nephew, David Valdez, who is the, the person really behind the career of Alberto Valdez. Uh, Alberto uh, passed away in 1998, and it's been a vision of David's to really uh, uphold his uncle's work and, and get it recognized for what it is. And, and Todd, actually, we produced a catalog, and if anybody's watching this podcast and wants one, just write us and let us know, and we'll send them one. But uh, Todd wrote a forward to this uh, in a very academic way, and... Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to get, if they have a chance, to come and read it. I think we're publishing this online as well under our blog section, so you can see the catalog that way if you don't want a physical one. Um, but what Todd basically did was went back into Alberto's life and, like, who is Alberto, right? Who is Alberto? Tell us. Uh, Alberto is a very unique mix of um, someone who's extremely creative and reclusive and someone who's also very resourceful, who had a, um, a very adventurous um, um, beginning of his life uh, serving in World War II and then uh, went back to um, L.A. to create work. Um, he's um, uh, the product of an, uh, a family of immigrants from Mexico City. So um, he's someone who's a self-taught artist. And so there's, um, he's interesting. He's a mixed bag because he's not an academic, academically trained artist. He uh, was brought up in the um, art studios in, in Hollywood. And so he's a very technical artist, uh, but someone who uh, took a long time to come and do his own, which is interesting. Well, it's a very interesting that uh, his process and the fact that he found his voice and it's really unique. If you look at his work, it's just fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about the influence from the, from the World War II section. Where was he stationed? Was it Pacific or was it? He was in the European Europe? theater and he was first stationed in France. And um, you can imagine that he was encountering in, in the culture of France um, early modernism. And that would be Picasso, Paul Klee, the early surrealists. And then uh, he went on to serve in Italy, and there he would have encountered um, uh, the Italian Baroque. And the thing about Italian culture that I think is interesting to note is that uh, the past and the, the present exist alongside of each other. In other words, there's, you know, in every city center, there's medieval ruins and new buildings. And that's very unique to, Euro to European culture, specifically to Italy. And so uh, Alberto would have seen the Baroque. Um, in that section. So what's unique about Alberto is he's combining like European modernism, Italian Baroque, pre-Columbian art. He's, he's mixing these, these um, buckets of art that normally don't really go together very well, but he's a unique guy. He sees the connection. That's what's so great about his artwork. Yeah, no, I, his influence, uh, you can tell, especially from what I see in the, uh, the Cubist era from Picasso, uh, how he dissected that. Um, what are his other influences? Um, well, I mentioned pre-Columbian. In this group of drawings, it's interesting, he's, he's looking at African art, mostly art of um, the Ivory Coast. So, um, and those are like small fetish figures, the small bronzes that come from that area of the world. So again, um, those are his influences. Um, according to David, um, you know, Alberto didn't travel much after he returned back from World War II. He really was pretty stationary in LA. There's no evidence of him even going on a vacation. Um, but he seems a little bit reclusive. He was very reclusive, but he wasn't, he was worldly. And according to David, he would have like um, subscriptions to books in magazines from Europe, and most of them in, in not in English. He would just look at them. So I have a feeling that um, Alberto was a, a, was a conduit of, of sorts, where he was sourcing different things and trying to see how they all amalgamate and come together. 
and you didn't have to travel to do that. In mid 20th century, you had mail order. And so mm-hmm. he took advantage of that. And I guess his house is full of books and magazines mm-hmm. as reference. I, I, when I'm looking at the body work, not necessarily at these charcoals that we're going to be discussing, uh, it seems there's also a lot of Mesoamerican influence uh, from the Industrial Revolution, like the Diego Rivera uh, eras, Tamayo uh, as well. Uh, would you say that? Ab- absolutely. In fact, um, it would be you know Diego Rivera, Orozco, Siqueiros. Those artists in the 30s were working in America. So Alberto, being a young Mexican immigrant artist, he would have really responded to those great giants from Mexico working in America. And I'm sure that would have fueled his uh, inspiration and given him a sense of real identity as a Chicano artist. Because you know it was later in the 70s and 80s we have the Chicano movement, but really it was spawned by those master artists from Mexico in the 30s. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, before we, we get into the subject matter uh, of the the charcoals that we're going to be releasing, and, and this is very limited uh, work. Uh, I didn't even realize we that there was charcoal drawings, but they're very beautiful. But what I would like to point out is what's beautiful about them, not just the imagery, because I'm going to let you talk about the imagery, but his shading techniques. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the depths and gradation that he's he's uh, putting into these drawings, um, he's he's really bringing out curves and lines, and it, it's just beautiful work. Um, tell us a little bit about the imagery. We talked a little bit that before we started recording this program uh, about the androgynous right. part. So describe that again. I will. Um, these drawings are interesting because they reveal an aspect of. Alberto's imagery that commonly gets overlooked in his paintings, but these drawings really pull up um, the concept of duality to the fore in these drawings. And you see it um, with um, male, both male and female figures in these drawings. Okay, that's the androgynous aspect of it. He often portrays a figure as both being male and female, uh, divided by like a hemispherical division right through the drawing in the middle. And ancient, you can tell he's looking at ancient art and looking at ancient values because ancient people across the world, you can find this in all different types of cultures, would it, would understand that both the merger of male and female would determine the the optimum human being. Yeah, and, we we discussed that too yeah. in, in the Native American cultures. Uh, I know in the Navajo cultures, uh, in the Spanish that came through here, they're like, "Oh, that's amujerado." But those people were elevated in their cultural societies, right? Yeah, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and we're not talking about physical union as much as a spiritual union for Alberto, because Alberto's a spiritualist. Ultimately, he's yeah. looking back into history, trying to pull the wisdom from the past and, and plant it into um, the present in the in, in his present. Um, his existence as an artist in the later 20th century. Um, Also in the drawings, um, uh, you mentioned the the shading. That would have been um, the characteristic that he would have saw from Italian art when he was stationed in Italy because Mm -hmm. it's called chiaroscuro, and it's, it's a very dramatic use of light and dark, and there's extreme versions of it and um, he happens to be using a very extreme version, and it's for a good, very good reason. It heightens emotion. Mm-hmm. And these drawings are very emotive. They don't have any color in them. They don't need it because they have that chiaroscuro, they have that drama, that light in it. Yeah, they're, they're amazing drawings, man. I just, I love them. I might have to get one myself. Uh, me as well. <laughs> me as so well. We, one, one of the, the pieces that we should talk about is the Godhead. Right. Right. And, and that uh, encompasses everything you're talking about. Absolutely. So you have the, the female figure on the right side and the male figure on the left kind of in an emergence. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, but also the, the exterior shading, which gives it that chascuro, uh, and then the lighting around it. So it's kind of glowing. Absolutely. It's just amazing. Just the thought process that he's going through. Yeah. And you can see, um, you talked about contemporary, um, influences that glow that you're seeing around the figure that occurs a lot in the, all the drawings that comes from, um, Ricardo Martinez paintings. And, um, you know, Alberto was very influenced with the way that Alberto would backlight a figure and make it mysterious. These drawings, every time you look at one of these drawings, you have a sense that you're looking into a place, a space where the, this figure exists. And that's very special that an artist can immediately bring you into a 9 by 12 area and think you're in another dimension. It's very transcendental, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. And so he's covering a lot of 
area <laughs> from the 30s transcendentalism to current. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so some of his works uh, you can see at the Autry Museum, uh, or I think the Smithsonian has one. Um, I'm not sure about the Getty. Does the Getty have one? Yep. So, it, so he is starting to get recognition, and uh, Blue Rain has actually been starting to sell this, uh, his work more and more. Uh, but this is an artist that was reclusive and painted for 40, 50 years and not selling anything. He was not commercially motivated at all. He just did this out of pure passion and thought, right? And so we have uh, David Valdez who has all this collection and he just gives us little nuggets here and there. And this is one of those nuggets and one of those times to pay attention. Um, what, what's the average price on these? Uh, they go below $3,000. So they're very affordable, very approachable for any collector. Um, it's a great entryway into Alberto's work. You know, some of his paintings, um, you know, exceed $30,000. So this is definitely a way. And these are special pieces. Um, they are a little piece of Alberto's energy. And that energy is very powerful and it does transcend centuries. Well, it's wonderful that we're able to get these and, and have a, a, a beautifully well-written tribute to him by you, Todd. Thank you. Uh, and again, um, you, can, you can write us and we'll, we'll, we'll ship these off to you. Um, or you can look at it on, on our blog section on our website. Well, thank you for coming in today, Todd. Thank you. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to come out to the opening reception, uh, which is March 31st, and it runs through April 15th. And uh, if you want to see these in live in person, they're, they're more powerful. Um, I'd like to encourage you to also subscribe to our podcast. Uh, you can find us on BlueRainGallery.com under podcast, or you can go to Spotify or any of the platforms. Um, also, um, I just released Circumspect. That's a design that I did through Blue Rain Print Shop. So, you know, bring art into your everyday life. Go to BlueRainPrintShop.com. <laughs>